uh, it's October 31st, 2010, here at uh, 1020 in the morning in the office of Yehuda Abner, picking up our second part of our interview. Uh, I'm Eli Wogelanter, and this is Yehuda Avner. So let's start with um, the momentous day in your life, November 3rd, <coughs> 1947, the age of 18, and you've said goodbye to your family, and you get on a boat, the... Aegean Star. Aegean Star. Mm. And your feelings as you get on the boat... The feeling I'm getting on the boat is excitement, anticipation, discovery. Remember that I'd been a child of World War II, uh, locked up, uh, isolated in the, the island of the United Kingdom uh, from 1939. And now we're talking about 1947. And I, like most of my generation, had never been abroad before. And uh, here I was with a group of friends on our way. Uh, we traveled through France overnight from Paris to Marseille. Uh, and uh, there was this tub. It was more of a tub than a boat, I think. Uh, uh, the reason why I, I say that, I think all in all it I'm comparing it to today's liners. I think it had three decks <laughs> uh, uh, and the steerage. And uh, it was a, I think November the 3rd, it was a Friday. At any rate, we traveled overnight. We, 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 we took a taxi, we came to the docks. Uh, there was the Aegean Star. Uh, and once we'd settled into our cabins, I use the word settle into our cabins, you know, just the thrill of a cabin. As a boy, you read about cabins, but here I was in the cabin. Bunks, three, four, five of us at bunk. And then we went on deck and to see the hustle and the bustle of uh, the, the cranks and, the, and, uh, and, and the, the chains and the lowering and the hiring of all the, all the victuals and the, uh, the, the, the whatever it takes to cross the Mediterranean. And then a yellow and green bus. It drove up and stopped by the boat followed by another yellow and green bus. Uh, and out of it, the shuffled, I can't even say walked, the shuffled a group of people, the likes of which I'd never seen before. Uh, today you'd call them skeletal. You'd call them matchstick figures. Uh, they were survivors, Holocaust survivors were about to board this ship. Uh, the, the, the term of, of the day was not Holocaust survivors, but DPs, displaced persons. And displaced by the war, by the Holocaust, by the, horror, the, 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 the fact that displaced, in fact, none of them had any real papers. They had no country to go back to. If they had a country to go back to, they didn't want to go back to. Because Europe was, a, for them, one big cemetery. And there they stood lining up along the wharf. And French officials had set up trestle tables. Uh, and uh, loudspeakers were barking at them, instructing them. Uh, to line up in order, family by family, how many had families, most of them didn't have families, and there whatever papers they had was checked. And what papers did most of them have? I learned subsequently an international Red Cross document affirming, attesting to the fact that they were displaced persons. Uh, most of them that transpired did not have visas to Palestine. I use the word visa. It was not the term that was used in those days. The word was certificates. 
uh, everything was a matter of getting hold of a certificate for Palestine. And I, who had the British passport, with a student's visa inside, uh, to me, that was my certificate to stay in Eretz Israel. Uh, I had no intention of going back to England. Although, by the terms of the scholarship of which I had received to go to the Machon, the Institute for Youth Leaders, after one year I was to return for a few years of work in Zionist youth movements, the Neikiva. But here, inside, I decided that this was my entry ticket into Eretz Israel, and I'm not going to leave. Subsequently, of course, I did. However, uh, vividly do I remember the captain of this uh, tumble-down Greek ship called the Aegean Star, standing there on the deck and looking down with utter contempt on these, these lines of people who were being processed to board his ship. And in later years I thought to myself, why that look? And it occurred to me that uh, when he took his captain's certificate, however many years it was before, he didn't think that his amb ambition would be to carry people from a place where they were not welcome, France, to a place where they were not wanted, Eretz Israel. And it was probably the joint that was paying uh, for carrying them and in other words he was living of Jewish charity and was all the more again this is the mind working years back photographing in the memory that scene of him dressed in this magnificent white marine outfit with epaulets gold epaulets and so forth standing there on the bridge looking down with contempt at these people up they came and uh, they were they were directed straight into the steerage. I, we, my friends, we were paying passengers. So there was no first class or second class. As I said, there were a couple of decks of cabins. And then there was steerage. And they were immediately uh, directed into steerage. And I'm talking here maybe 100, 150 people. And once there, the captain took a megaphone. And I have in my diary the exact words, but I paraphrase, in which he said that anybody on my ship who does not have legal entry permits for Palestine uh, and uh, who makes trouble of one sort or another on arrival uh, will be treated in the harshest of fashion. And, I remember there will be discipline on my ship, something, there will be discipline on my ship. And I went downstairs, to, I went down into the, into the steerage to see who these people were. And I overheard a young fellow, so an older fellow, saying in Yiddish, Rus Ret the Admiral, what is the Admiral talking about? And this young fellow, was about my age, 17, thereabouts. He was a yeshiva bocha. And I mean a Talmud student in the classic sense of the peyot, the side curls, and the little fluffy little beard of a kid of 18, 17, and uh, a, a, a pie-shaped yeshiva hat, black hat. This was the admiral. And whoever he spoke to, he was speaking to an older person. So he, he kind of, he, I remember him saying, as, as old game, Berech Nafis, which is the Yiddish idiom of the day, he let it break your leg. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we, anchor was hauled and off we went into the Mediterranean. And this itself was a thrill just a change of climate from the grey skies of England to the azure blue skies of the Mediterranean. And I was curious about this boy because he was my age. He was a survivor. Uh, 
So I went down again, and there was a game of ping pong. They'd taken two boards, attached them together, and made a. And I, I remember there were, there were two survivor kids. Uh, as I say, they, they were drawn. They, they looked, they looked, they looked uh, or twice that age. But they were kids. But they could play ping pong. And one of them was this boy. He knew how to play ping pong. So, when he finished the game, he turned to me and he said, uh, in Yiddish, do uh, the macher. I best and I'm a macher. You don't belong here. You don't belong among us. You're normal. He didn't say that, but behind that word, do the macher, was, was a it was a contempt, it was an envy, uh, it was a sense of arrogance. What do you know about life? That kind of thing. And he asked me where I came from. So I told him. And I asked him, where do you come from? He said, my name is Yosef Kosolovich from Auschwitz. I'm saying, you heard that. My name wasn't yet Avner, it was Hafner. I hadn't Hebrew, Hebrew is my name yet. Yehuda Hafner from Manchester. And it's been Yosel Kosolovich from Auschwitz. And then again with that arrogance, he said, do you play chess? I said, yeah. He said, all right, I'll take you on. I'll beat you within five moves. So, uh, you know, this already was a challenge. Uh, I thought I was a relatively good chess player. I'll beat you in five moves. So I told him, I'm my cabin number, you should come there. I had a chess set. And as I was setting out the chess sets, he, without a knock on the door, just comes striding in with a pot belly under his, under his, his, uh, uh, capota with his long jacket coat was a, a melon and uh, I said uh, where did you get that from? he said I stole it from the the first class kitchen so what do you mean you stole it? he said that's how I survive and he took out from his pocket a s stiletto and I could see a beautiful handle, and it was an SS handle. And he sliced the flesh of the melon with about the one go, and I was appalled. Uh, the stealing the stiletto SS. So I said, Where did you get that from? He said, Oh, I, I used to play in the Auschwitz cabaret. The Auschwitz cabaret. So imagine the scene. I'm this uh, innocent young kid, and he is coming along, stolen stiletto SS. Auschwitz cabaret. What's the Auschwitz cabaret? His father. He told me he'd been a Badchen. A Badchen being a entertainer at Jewish weddings. A chassid would be a Badchen. And he, from his father, had learned all kinds of tricks. And he told me that at night, in the barracks, at the end of the, well, he called it the end of the working day, in, in the end of the torturous working day, he would entertain his fellow survivors in the barracks. Uh, and it was noted by one of the capos, one of the guards there, who reported it to the, the SS guards, and they came and they... And he told me one day he was taken out of the ranks and he was marched. He assumed that he was 
are they going to be tortured to death or for what he'd been doing? Or he was just going to be thrown alive into a furnace for what he'd been doing? And then he was taken to the office of one of the senior commanders of the SS in Auschwitz, who told him that we've seen what you've been doing and we want you to entertain us at our Christmas party in 10 days' time the SS Christmas party and I remember breaking into a big smile he said wow what an evening I gave them I was a mimic I I, 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 I was a comedian I was and he was very proud of what he'd done and that he called the Auschwitz cabaret why the deal was this so long as you keep on us laughing we'll keep you alive and so they put him on kitchen duty to fatten himself up. But then he got pneumonia or cholera or something. And uh, he went, had to go back into the barracks. But he was starving crazy one day. And he, he knew the kitchen. So he sneaked back in and he stole some scraps. One of the SS guards caught him at it and he hit him with the butt of the rifle on the forehead because he had two, there weren't scars, there was a kind of two pathways bare that separated his eyebrows uh, and that's how he got them. Uh, and I suddenly burst into tears when he told me this. After all the b b bravado, he suddenly burst into tears. And he told me that I'd lost my father and my mother and my two brothers and my three sisters and I'm the only one left and so on. A couple of days later, he said he wanted to speak to me. Oh, by the way, we played chess and he, and he finished me off within five moves. And he was saying that this is the Gemara, it's a Talmudic mind that I used to study Talmud in my head in Auschwitz and I used to play chess in my head in Auschwitz. A couple of days later, shortly before we were landing, day or so before we were due to land, he said he wanted to show me something. So he took me down and we went back into the, the dormitory or whatever you call it, of, 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 of uh, steerage. Everybody was packed into. He took out two very soiled envelopes. And he read them to me. One was a letter from his uncle in Jerusalem, who was a Rosh Shiva. And this was his father's brother. Um, who said Yatsula, you're the last one survivor of the whole family and we knew that your dear parents all they wanted for you was that you should carry on the tradition of Yiddishkeit and we look upon you as our own son come and join us in Yerushalayim and build yourself a Jewish home with children, let's restart life in the spirit of the tradition, the orthodox yeshiva tradition of your family. The other letter was from his mother's brother in a Shomatsaya kibbutz, saying, Yosala, forget all that mumbo jumbo. It was a bitter letter, it was because of those rebellion who discourage people to come to Eretz Israel. Uh, uh, come and join us, be a new Jew. Uh, we believe in socialism, we believe in human humanism, we believe uh, in, in, in building ourselves and our land. The ideology of the day of the left-wing kibbutzim Come and join us and start your new life as a new Jew. 
he looks at me and says, which one should I choose? And I came over with shivers. I was a kid, what the hell did I know? And I, I said to them, this is for me. And the little Yiddish I knew, I said, this, this is not for me. And, uh, and he gave me a look of, I say contempt, it was more than contempt, as if to say, why the hell did I think that you, a stupid idiot like you, who come from, was, could, could even have an opinion on this thing? And then he gave me the shock of my life. He said, I've no certificate, I've no legal visa entry. I'm not going to be put behind barbed wire again. I spent too much of my life behind barbed wire. When we come to Haifa, I'm going to jump ship. So here again, this innocent me. <laughs> uh, the very thought of jumping ship. Uh, lo and behold, we came to Haifa. That in itself, in those days, 1947, you stay up all night, all of you, or the whole ship is staying up all night to get to see the first light in the distant horizon of Eretz Israel. And everybody was up on deck, looking, looking. And one light becomes two lights, nine lights, 15 lights, and there you see the coastline of Eretz Israel. And as dawn breaks before you, you see Haifa. Now, the mind is not playing tricks on me. I am telling you that my first impression of Haifa, from the Bay of Haifa, as dawn was breaking, was that of a a massive cemetery. Why? Because my eyes had never seen a hill, it's a mountain, uh, of tier upon tier upon tier of buildings, some of them high buildings. So from that deck in that haze of the morning, you think, I thought of the spies who came to Moshe Rabbeinu and spoke about Hanafilim, the giants. <laughs> and this association, when I saw the terraced structure of the way Haifa was built, uh, is the fact that here I am decades later and I can still recall that first view of Haifa. What an impression it made on me. Of course, as the sun began to rise, you see, you see uh, an inspiring sight. Taifa is a beautiful city when you're in it. And it's very beautiful when you're looking at it out from the sea. And from Stevich, you suddenly begin to hear a faint lilt of words that evolve into a hum and the hum becomes a song they're singing Hatikva and the whole boat sings Hatikva next thing you know is uh, you're anchored you're by on the wharf, uh, the boat is tied, and lining the wharf are uh, the 6th Airborne Division, Red Beret, British, crack troops, lining the wharf, uh, all of them, the rifles at the ready. Behind them, in groups, um, British police, they look invincible in their polished boots and their uniforms. And they're looking up at us lining the rails. And you could see 
the difference between the expression on their faces as they saw us, the passengers, and as they look down and see the steerage. And when they see the steerage, uh, in my mind's eye, my youth imagination, it looked as if they were about to receive a contingent of convicts because they knew that most of them did not have papers. And then in the most typical, characteristic fashion imaginable, a voice over the megaphone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Palestine. Uh, those of you who have legal entry permits, would you please line up uh, at the uh, dining room to be processed? Um, those of you who do, do not have uh, legal entry permits, would you be so kind as to remain in your locations in steerage and you will be processed eventually? Using the same word, meaning one is off the boat into Eretz Israel, the other one is off the boat into a detention, uh, arrested. And nobody knew what the word detention actually meant. It could mean going to Atlit. Atlit was a detention camp. It could mean being shipped off to Cyprus. It could mean shipped off to somewhere else. Who knew? And there we all were, we who had our official entry permits lining up. And suddenly there's a commotion, and there is this Yasser Kosolovich jumping out of a lifeboat onto a deck right by the railing with a view to jumping ship. But unbeknownst to him, that under that lifeboat were two soldiers, British soldiers. And they grabbed him, and he kicked them away, and he got loose. And he began to frenziedly run about the deck. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the police and, and the soldiers were running after him. And the, 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 the other DPs were throwing their baggage in the way of the soldiers and running after him as obstacles to stop him. And he was running towards a certain point where again were a group of soldiers ready to tackle him, so he turned back and he ran up the steps to the bridge. And there the captain gave him a wallop across the back of his neck that just filled him. And then up came a number of soldiers, manacled him and dragged him off. Uh, and as he passed me by, there was blood from an ear, I remember that he had a black eye and so on. And he spat at me and said, uh, I'll, I'll see you soon, Macha. I'll see you soon, Macha. And that was the 